Okay, uh, now we'll start about talking about the ocular biometry in preparation for the part one exams. Um, I repeat, this is like a crash course to let you know or understand the high lead questions what have appeared in previous exams, um, make you focus in your study, especially for those who are having the exam next week. So what is ocular biometry for the fresh graduates here is biometry is just a method of applying mathematics to biology. What we have is that uh, we have cataract surgery in which we go in, we remove the lens of the eye and we want to put another uh, IOL or an intraocular lens inside the eye to make the patient see better. So the question is, what is the power of this lens that if I put inside the eye in this place, it will um, put the image on the retina and make the patient see very well. So um, many questions have arised. Should I have an emetropic eye? Should I get the power of the lens to be exactly on the retina? Or do we need it to be a bit hypermetropic or myopic? Many questions. One of the questions that will um, come in the exam is that whatever you decide, depending on what the patient needs. So some patients would say, OK, I want one eye to be able to see the, the near things. And other eye would be uh, to see the distant, better distant vision. Um, so you, what you need to know is that you need to keep the difference between both eyes less than three diopters. This is what the answer that they like in the exam to keep the anisometropia or the difference in the power in between both eyes less than three diopters. So starting from the very beginning, this was the most basic equation that they come, came up with to be able to produce the power of the IOL that we need to put. So we had, uh, they put an A constant minus 0.9 K, which is the average catometer value in diopters, minus 2.5 as the lens. So this is like the very basic uh, equation. We don't use it now, but you'll always find it in the exam. So this one you need to memorize by heart, please, because uh, it is a definite in any exam you you will attend, you will have a question about that. And we will now go through each one of them, what questions will come and what do they mean and all of that. Uh, they usually show you, show you an outprint uh, like this one, uh, showing the right eye, the left eye, so many numbers. You feel so confused, especially if you're a fresh graduate, what are all of these numbers? So we'll walk you through the equation and then you'll understand what this printout means. So as we saw the equation one, the first thing was having an A constant. So it is a constant, however, it's highly variable. It depends on the IOL, on the surgery, on the axial lens measurements. Um, luckily, it's now easier to use depending on the lens and you can find it on the lens uh, boxes and all of that. But what do you need to know for the exam? Is that it approximately varies with a ratio of one to one because if we go back to the equation, it's a power equal a constant minus blah 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 so any change in the a will equal the exact change in the power of the iol so this is something that you need to know so a previous question will be that showed up in an exam will be the a constant is increased from 118 to 119 what will be the effect to the iol power so you you remind yourself of the equation that whatever you change here will just be translated to the power. So the IOL power should be one after higher as the relationship between the A constant and the IOL power is linear. The next thing we have in the equation is measuring the axial lens, which is measured from the anterior corneal surface to the RPE. Um, we have two ways of measuring our eyes. So you can either use light waves or sound waves. So if you're using light waves, this is an optical measurement. If you're using sound waves, this is an ultrasound. The optical, are, I'm sure you've heard about it, IOL Master and Lenstar. These are the ones that use light waves to give you an accurate measurement of the eye, of the eye lens. Uh, the ultrasound can be either contact or immersion, as we have seen, uh, like the immersion bath. So what is the difference between the three, the points that they ask you about in the MCQ? That the um, advantage of measuring it optically is that it's non-contact, so you're not touching the patient, so it's better accuracy. However, if you're having any media opacity, if you're having dense cataracts, 
uh, corneal opacity, vitreous hemorrhage, anything like that, you will not be able to measure the axial lens. So in these, uh, in these situation, that's when you go for the ultrasound. You have two, as we said, we have contact and immersion. Contact is better in medial opacity. However, as you are contacting the corneal surface, you might indent it. And so this corneal compression can, can give you subjective errors. Um, the emotions avoids corneal compression. However, uh, there is less control over alignment because the patient might be looking right or left. Uh, it's not very easy to control the patient with the immersion, um, not like with the contact. So these are the advantage and disadvantages of the three uh, three ways of measuring the axial lens, and this is what they ask you about in the um, in the exam. So the last measurement you need to be able to put in the very basic equation and get the power of the lens is the keratometry. So which is checking the steepness of the cornea to get an approximate measure of its power. So previously the cornea was assumed to be a perfect spherical optical convex mirror with specs anterior to posterior curvature, which is not true as we as we know. Uh, the curvature is different from the center to the periphery and so on, and also from the interior surface and the posterior surface are not the same. So uh, the basic error in most keratometers, this is a question that have, have appeared before, it, that it doesn't calculate the corneal curvature accurately because we need to estimate the power of the back of the cornea. So this has appeared in an exam before. What is the basic error in most keratometers? Uh, computerized video keratography or the most advanced imaging now will give you better results for the keratometry and so will give us better outcomes after the cataract surgery. Going back to the whole uh, printout, what we need to look at, especially in the exam, is this box. So it tells you the axial lens, you have it, in, and then all of these measurements are related to the cornea. And these are very, very important, and they get you so many questions on these uh, few numbers. So what do you need to know is that you have K1 and K2, which are the two axes of the cornea or the corneal power. The steep axis is indicated by the higher K. So if they ask you what is the steep axis in this eye, you pick the higher number. So it's K2. So what is the axis of the steep uh, meridian? It's at 62 degrees. Uh, also, this printout will give you the cell, which is an approximation of the cylindrical correction needed by the patient. What, why do you need to look at this as well? Is that because if you see that the difference between the two Ks here is different from the final cylinder that patient should have, then you have lenticular astigmatism as well, which means you have astigmatism coming from the lens, which will be removed on its own when you do the cataract surgery and remove the uh, crystalline lens. So this is called the effective negative cylinder. And of course, the steep axis will be the one perpendicular to it. So it's just like the glasses, the cylinder, um, the, the minus, this minus power acts on the uh, 90 degree axis from this one. Remember that with the rule and against the rule, the with the rule is that you have the steeper axis at 90 degrees and against the rule is at 180. Uh, one other point to remember is that if you're doing uh, a corneal incision, it will affect the astigmatism or the corneal curvature. And how is that? Um, I hope I can explain it easy for you. So if we look at the dashed lines, this is where your cornea is supposed to be. And then now we are going to make two incisions over this axis, one over here, one over here. What will happen is that the IOP or the interocular pressure will, will push from the inside on the weak areas that you have made um, an incision in. And so the central part will just be pulled down or be more flattened. So when you're doing a corneal incision, you always want to do it on the steep axis to make it flatter, and so you can fix the astigmatism uh, during your cataract surgery. So again, remember that the refractive astigmatism may include a lenticular component, which means 
may include some astigmatism from the lens. This will be dealt by the lens removal during the surgery. So you need to look at the case as we have um, shown before. Again, the astigmatic effect of the incision increases with the depth and the lens. So if, if you're doing a deep incision, you're causing more flattening. If you're doing a big incision, you're causing more flattening. And this has uh, appeared in the exam before asking if you had, uh, if you made a larger corneal incision, um, what effect it will have on the uh, on that meridian, it will cause more flattening. Uh, this was an, a question that appeared before as well. Where would you make your incision if you want to reduce astigmatism? Again, you do it, as I said, on the steep axis. So you look at your case, you pick the one with the highest number, basically. So you'll do it at the 62 degrees because um, this incision will reduce the steepness of the axis. Going back to the uh, equation, the basic equation, please remember it. P equal A minus 0.9 K minus 2.5 axial lens. Uh, what, what does this equation tell you? It tells you the importance of the keratometer and the axial lens. So any change you're going to have in the axial lens is multiplied by 2.5 and then showing an effect on your power. So any small error in the axial lens will hugely affect your power. Um, also, any change in, in your catometer or any errors in your catometer will affect your power, power as well, but not as much as the axial lens. Luckily, now we have many formulas, and in the exam, they've started to, <laughs> to give focus on the formulas, not only on the basic equation. So you'll get many, um, you know, uh, uh, tables telling you when to use what, and they're Many of them can be used in many conditions and and they're all having very lovely names, as you can see. So let's simplify the situation here. We have generations of the formula, which means that we started with a basic equation of P equals so and so and so. And then we had more advanced equation that uh, improved the accuracy of picking an, a correct uh, power for the IOL. So we had an SRK1 and then SRK2, this is the second generation, and then SRKT or theoretical, this is the third with Hoffer Q, Holiday, and then there is Holiday 2 and Hages. Okay, these are too much names for you to remember. What do you need to know? So you can always remember that having a holiday is the best thing. So Holiday 2 can give you roughly accurate measurements in all kind of uh, uh, eye axial lens. So from very short axial lens to very high axial lens, holiday is, is the best thing you can have, you know, vacation and so on. Uh, what they always ask you is Hoffer Q, which is uh, very good for short eyes. And, and that the SRKT, the third one, the theoretical one, is very, also very good for the large eyes. So what do they ask you in the exams? that the basic thing for any formula is to have the axial lens and the average catometer. These are the basic things you need to calculate the power. Then the new, uh, um, all the new um, formulas have added, or most of them have added the anterior chamber depths. So, so if they told you what is the difference between the Hages formula and SRK1, you say adding the anterior chamber depths. What is the difference between Hofer Q and SRK2? adding the anterior chamber lens. Uh, one other thing that comes is that the whole day too, as we said, it's the best. So for it to be the best means that it uses more measurements. It, ha it has uh, more input or more, inf more information to give you more accurate measurements. So it adds also the patient age, preoperative refraction, wide to wide diameter. So it's very uh, comprehensive. To put it all in uh, a table, if they tell you, OK, your patient is hypermetropic and the axial lens is less than 22 millimeter, what to pick? You can pick any of these two, but please pick Hoffer Q. If it's in the middle, they usually don't ask, but you can <laughs> because this is like the uh, normal range. You can use any. You can use Barrett. You can use SRK2, uh, SRKT. Sorry. Uh, if you have a myopic patient, they would want you to use the SRKT. However, if you have a holiday two in the options, then you can safely pick it. 
because holiday too is very, very good in all uh, kind of axial lenses. So let's see another question from a previous exam. During cataract surgery, a complication occurs and the decision is made to place the IOL in the sulcus instead of the, in the bag. So what does that mean? Uh, for our first graduates, if you are removing the cat, removing the lens, um, you would like to put the your new lens inside the bag, which is inside the capsule. So like here, if you are not, if there is any problem with the capsule, the posterior capsule, and you're not able to put it in, you put it in front of the anterior capsule, and this is called the sulcus, or you can put it in the anterior chamber, iris fixation or angle fixation, and it will be over here. So changing the place of your lens will, will definitely affect uh, the refraction at the end because the, this lens has a fixed power, so it will project the image at a certain place. So if you uh, take this lens and put it in front of the eye this patient will be uh, myopic so uh, what is the appropriate lens power for placement in the sulcus in this patient so you decrease the power by one because you've put the lens in a more anterior position and you want it uh, a weaker lens so the image will fall will also fall on the retina there was a question that has appeared in the very old exams that the initial needed power or the adjustment if you're placing the IO on the sulcus instead of the bag, uh, that it depends on the power of the initial lens. So if you were supposed to put an eight diopter lens, then there is no change. But if it is then 17.5 diopter, then you should uh, decrease the power by 0.5 diopters. Uh, if it's between 17.5 7, and 28, then you decrease one diopter. If it's more than 28 diopters, you decrease 1.5 diopter. But um, it has been a while since this question has appeared. Um, again, the same idea, 21 diopter lens is placed in the anterior chamber rather than the posterior chamber where it is intended. What does that mean? That means you're, there's, there will be an induced myopia or the patient will be myopic because the image will be formed in front of the retina. Uh, this is a question to remind you of why you need to know that the, the velocity of the sound waves in the eye is between 1500 to 1600. Is what if you have a silicon filled eye after vitrectomy and you need to calculate the power of the IOL? So the velocity of sound in silicon is slower, so the eye will appear bigger or longer on the ultrasound. Um, many papers have come out about what to do. There are many equations and there are uh, many advances in the uh, devices that you use to, to measure and they can calculate everything for you. But for the sake of the exams, um, what if it's a silicon eye and you have an axial, uh, a measured axial lens from a silicon eye? you multiply by 0.7, which is a correction factor, and this will give you the corrected axial lens, and hopefully will give you an accurate uh, power of the IOL. Uh, another question that has came before, that when you remove the silicon oil, there is a myopic shift to be expected, uh, three to five diopters. And this, is, this concludes most of the questions that have come on biometry. So please take a, a, a break for a minute, and then we'll go for OCT.